This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Today, we're talking about astronauts and UFOs. This is always a fun topic of conversation, but we're talking about it today because a recent interview with an astronaut spawned countless headlines around the world. On Sunday, January 5th, The Guardian published an interview with astronaut Helen Sharman, the first British person to make it to space. And she talks about aliens in this interview. Here's what she said, quote, aliens exist. There's no two ways about it. End quote. She also stated that, quote, it's possible they're here right now. End quote. That's a big statement, especially coming from someone who has been in space. And it's obviously excited. It's obviously excited a lot of people generating the headlines proclaiming that an astronaut said aliens are real and they're here on Earth. The headlines, of course, were very sensationalistic. They were overstating just a little bit. Here's the rest of what Sharman said, quote, there are so many billions of stars out there in the universe that there must be all sorts of different forms of life. Will they be like you and me made up of carbon and nitrogen? Maybe not. It's possible they're here right now and we simply can't see them, end quote. So did she reveal some insider astronaut knowledge about aliens on Earth? No, she simply surmises that all sorts of different life must exist in the universe. Some life forms might be visible, might, might not be visible to the human eye, and some of that life could conceivably be on Earth and we wouldn't know it. That doesn't mean that what she said isn't cool. I think it's very cool. I'm always fascinated to hear what people who have been in space have to say about intelligent alien life or about UFOs. And there have been several astronauts over the years who have commented on aliens and or UFOs. So let's talk about a few of them. The first one we'll talk about today is Pavel Popovich. Yeah, so this was cosmonaut Pavel Popovich. He was the first Ukrainian cosmonaut and the eighth human in space. He was also a survivor after living under the Nazi occupation for almost two years as a young child. So, uh, that was a pretty interesting attribute to this story. Um, he grew yeah. up to be a, uh, an amateur pilot and engineer, and he worked his way up to being, a, uh, to being considered as a cosmonaut. His flight into space, uh, first one, was in 1962, and then his second in 1974 uh, was a pretty interesting mission, actually. He was part of um, a Soviet program of military people, um, and military use in space exploration technology. So Popovich and uh, his engineer at the time, they'd conducted military intelligence operations using infrared and optical equipment. And one of their tasks was to um, to capture the American Skylab station with uh, mm. the three astronauts on board at the time and, wow. you know, kind of see what they were up to. And yeah. this was, you know, obviously still bitterness from the Americans winning the Cold War. And when they found out that Popovich had done this, the Americans actually came up with a nickname for him, which was the, quote, aggressor, which is pretty <laughs> interesting. He uh, definitely got a reputation. Um, so in <laughs> I think it was, yeah, 1978, he was traveling from Washington to Moscow from a conference, and along with the other passengers and pilots, they had a pretty dramatic UFO sighting of a triangular-shaped object trailing the airplane and then bypassing the airplane at, like, unbelievable speeds, mm. and then it disappeared. Nothing was tracked on radar, nothing was seen on the ground, but everyone on the plane agreed that they had seen it, so... From here, Popovich started looking into the UFO cases in Russia, and like many, he became obsessed with the topic and became a UFO researcher. In the early to mid-80s, he served as a deputy in the Commission for Anomalous Phenomena in the Environment, which was an academic UFO research program created by the USSR Academy of Sciences. And then in the 90s, he presided over the first official public Soviet Union UFO research organization. He advocated for the release of government documents related to UFOs, and he asserted that much of the UFO 
related information he received was from military and government sources, which is mm. always a good thing. Um, yeah. Well, not always, but usually a good thing. <laughs> and um, through his research, he concluded that most of what is written about UFOs is nonsense. I like this guy already. And um, <laughs> although he didn't believe claims of alien abductions or ET contact, he held the belief that ETs visit Earth and operate multiple bases on the planet. So pretty interesting stance. Um, yeah. It wasn't just Popovich, though, who was interested in UFOs. His wife, Marina Popovich, was a retired Soviet Air Force colonel and one of the most famous pilots in Russia. So she, too, was also a UFO researcher. She caught the bug, too. And you got to get this, you know, this Russian power couple some credit. They both became UFO researchers in Russia. And um, I thought that was pretty badass. She wrote a book. It was called The UFO Glasnost. And she asserted that the Soviet military confirmed over 3,000 UFO sightings and that the government possessed wreckage from five UFO crashes. So they pretty much had long careers in the military, space programs, and then in the UFO research community. Now, Talk about a powerhouse couple there. Powerhouse the UFO couple. research, yeah. <laughs> uh, Pavel, he spent his final years in Moscow in a settlement dubbed Star Village, which... Uh, housed over 36 former cosmonauts, retired cosmonauts. And after his death, a mountain range in Antarctica was actually named after him, and so was a minor planet. Uh, I wasn't able to figure out which one that was. I'll have to do some more research on that. But uh, pretty fulfilling life for both he and his wife, I would say. It's, it, it's also refreshing to hear about UFO researchers in other countries for once. So this is definitely one that um, I'm going to look more into for sure. Well, and the cosmonaut stories are also s super exciting. There's so much about, about cosmonauts and, and UFOs and just Russia in general, Russia UFOs. And, you know, for anybody interested in that, I highly recommend looking at the work of Paul Stonehill. Paul Stonehill does incredible research and, and has written extensively on Russian UFOs. So look into Paul Stonehill's work. Absolutely. Well, it's hard to find a conversation about astronauts and UFOs and not see Edgar Mitchell mentioned. Indeed, one of the most famous Apollo astronauts in the UFO circles is Edgar Mitchell. He was also the sixth man to walk on the moon and was a firm believer in UFOs, intelligent extraterrestrial life, and extraterrestrial visitation. The big three, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, the NASA astronaut and former Navy test pilot was an intelligent and very highly regarded scientist with a doctorate for MIT. So for most of us, it's pretty surprising that he publicly and confidently spoke about his extraterrestrial beliefs, and so often. Yeah. Uh, there are so many interviews with him within the community uh, where he's very adamant that this occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, one notable one is in 1996, Mitchell revealed on Dateline NBC, quote, I have no firsthand experience, but I have had the opportunity to meet with people from three countries who, in the course of their official duties, claimed, quote, I have no firsthand experience, but I have had the opportunity to meet with people from three countries who, in the course of their official duties, claim to have had personal firsthand encounter experiences, end quote. Now, during the same interview, Mitchell opined that UFO activity and UFO incidents like Roswell, big notable incidents, are covered up by governments. And this is a big reveal for somebody who is in a government-sponsored program like NASA. Also, in an interview with filmmaker James Fox, Mitchell shared his belief that humans have reverse engineered extraterrestrial te technology. Uh, this is a very hot topic right now, and it has been for a while. Uh, he believes that humans using this technology are possibly behind some UFO-related events like alien abduction. So that's a big can of worms. If, if you have uh, the government abducting humans posed as extraterrestrial species, there is a big problem there. Yeah. Yeah. In 2015, yeah. Mitchell told our buddy Lee Spiegel at the Huffington Post, quote, I have told several sources about my connections over the years with military officers manning missile silos during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, who told me personally of UFOs hovering over their missile sites and disabling the missiles targeting the Soviet Union, end quote. 
So Mitchell just passed away a couple years ago. And and this is personally a huge bummer for me because I, in 2013, was supposed to fly to his home in Florida and interview him. uh, Mm -hmm. And the interview got canceled by the production company the day before I was supposed to leave. And obviously that's, that's one of, I, I know Jason has as well, uh, personally sitting down and talking with astronauts who, uh, believe in the subject and, or have personal experience is uh, a big honor because it's very interesting to hear that sort of perspective. So, uh, very bummed. I missed my chance to talk with Edgar Mitchell. Yeah. He's been still involved in controversy over the years linked with Buzz Aldrin, uh, and, Mm -hmm. Uh, alleged lie detector tests uh, and a whole ball of worms that that may or may not uh, tie in with UFO sightings and astronauts. Did he punch a journalist in the face too? <laughs> Wouldn't that be <laughs> the way to go? <laughs> not Ed style. <laughs> no, no, that's that's Buzz all the way. <laughs> yeah, that's Buzz. Total Buzz. <laughs> And Mitchell spoke on countless occasions about his UFO and extraterrestrial beliefs. But as Nick Pope explained to The Mirror, quote, so far as I'm aware, most of his information on the issue comes not from things he's experienced himself, but from things he's been told by others, end quote. He continued, quote, clearly because of who he is, he's had access to government, military and intelligence community personnel at the highest level. But because quite understandably, He won't name his sources. We can't be certain these people were being straight with him or indeed that they were privy to any classified information about UFOs, end quote. Mitchell was a very curious person and he was confident in the UFO extraterrestrial information provided to him by people in the military and intelligence community. He told Spiegel, quote, I can't say where the aliens are from, but evidence of their presence here is pretty overwhelming if you care to look for it, end quote. So I was always fascinated hearing Edgar Mitchell talk about UFOs and intelligent extraterrestrial life. But for me personally, I always viewed his comments the same way I do with those of former Canadian Minister of Defense, Paul Hellyer. His views were based on unverifiable sources he was told by others, not things he saw or experienced himself. Now that doesn't mean it's not genuine or doesn't deserve to be considered, but It's important to keep in mind, keep that in mind and understand that no matter how exciting the claims sound and no matter who is restating those claims, it's still just second or third hand anecdotal information. And the value or weight of that type of supporting evidence really varies from person to person. It's up to every individual to decide for themselves how much weight they want to give that information and how much, if at all, they want that information to affect their personal beliefs. I think it's interesting that like a lot of these things with these people that have been in power or um, have reputations that it is just hearsay things they've heard, which is tough for us in the UFO field because we want like firsthand testimony. But it's so hard to get, especially when a lot of these things have happened so long ago and all the people involved, directly involved are gone at this point. So that was always my struggle with this stuff. Paul Hellier would say like, yeah, the guy's amazing and his reputation is, you know, superb. But then these things he's bringing forward, we have no idea how to verify any of it. So, yeah, it's it's always a struggle. It is. It's that that curse, you know, that we 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 celebrate when somebody of of these high caliber, high calibers come forward with it. We're talking about this topic in public. We're all yay, champion it, go run with it. But then when we step back and look at what's actually being said and where that information is coming from, you know, well, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Right. And then, you know, quotes get spun different ways, too. Look at like the, you know, don't trust everything on the Internet. Abraham Lincoln, you know, like stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> it's like things, headlines of articles, like you mentioned earlier, Jason, they get so sensationalized and quotes get out of context that right. you never you can never tell right from left up from down. So, it, again, it's just it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, well, it like, just shows that anyone with with, you know, credentials have to walk such a fine line, you know, uh, between their 
you know, we look at them for their credentials for, you know, some kind of authority behind their viewpoint. But on the other hand, most of the time, this is an opinion, a personal opinion. And it's difficult to separate personal opinion from their credentialed persona. And then, you know, and they have to be extremely careful about it. So, yeah, I think just like everything in ufology, it's clear as mud. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I like that, Shane. I'm Nick, the host of the UFO Chronicles podcast, with first-hand witness accounts of the strange and unexplained, covering UFOs, cryptids, conspiracies, and the paranormal. Real people, real encounters. So come with us on the journey into the unknown. UFO Chronicles podcast is available to listen to on all apps. I'll see you soon. Colonel Gordon Cooper is similar to Edgar Mitchell in that he was also an astronaut and military test pilot who publicly voiced his opinion about UFOs and extraterrestrials. But Cooper said he personally encountered UFOs. That's a little different. So Cooper was one of the seven original Mercury astronauts. He piloted the first space flight of NASA's Project Mercury, during which he became the first American to sleep in space. But according to Cooper, his UFO sightings occurred on Earth, not in space. In 1996, Cooper told Yolanda Gaskins, a reporter with the television show The Paranormal Borderline, about a fleet of UFOs he and other Air Force pilots observed over Germany in 1951. He described that these hundreds of metallic, saucer-shaped, unidentified craft, quote, were flying quite high. How high we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller craft still well above what we could get to, end quote. Six years later, while supervising test flights at Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew allegedly filmed a landing of a saucer-shaped UFO. He told Gaskins that, quote, a saucer came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear, and landed right out on the dry lake bed. They picked up their cameras and started over towards it, filming as they went, and when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in, the wheel wells, tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film. And they had to go through all the proper regulations of reporting this, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the base jet airplane. And I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since, end quote. Although Cooper didn't see the UFO for himself or get a chance to watch the filmed footage, he claims that he did hold up the developed film to the window before shipping it off to Washington, and that it did indeed show close-up shots of a saucer-shaped craft. Cooper was an advocate for seriously studying UFOs. He wrote a letter to the United Nations in 1978 proposing the establishment of a committee to explore UFOs from an quote, unbiased, neutral point of view, end quote. He stated in this letter, quote, I believe that these extraterrestrial visitors and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. I feel that we need to have a top-level, coordinated program to scientifically collect and analyze data from all over the Earth concerning any type of encounter and to determine how best to interface with these visitors in a friendly fashion, end quote. So this guy's really put it out there. I mean, he was hardcore pushing uh, for, for researching UFOs and was a firm believer in extraterrestrial visitation. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty, uh, not audacious, but ambitious, I would say, claims to bring forward. Again, it, I always come back to, like, these guys know what reputation they're going to leave behind. Yeah. And when they mm -hmm. come forward with these such ambitious claims, um, you got to think there's there's something to it. Like, they know more than the public is is finding out. So Yeah, and Gordon Cooper, his style of communication, he was so... 
direct and matter of fact and non sensationalistic in so many ways. It's hard not to really, you know, be captivated by not only what he's saying, but how, how he said it. And so I look at, uh, you know, I've read his book and look, look at his work and on TV and so forth. And, you know, the guy is, a, you know, straight up legit fighter pilot and astronaut and all those things. So, you know, I find it, his stuff very fascinating, actually. Yeah, and I know Amy Shiratito, our mutual colleague, uh, space historian, I remember her telling me that Gordon Cooper is the perfect astronaut. <laughs> like, that's how she, the <laughs> ideal astronaut, you know, clean cut, yeah. American guy going up into space and just as direct as all hell. So, yeah. there you go. True blue. <laughs> True blue. Boy Scout. <laughs> yeah, Boy Scout. Boy Scout too. There you go. Well, another astronaut who's commented about UFOs more recently and aliens as well is Story Musgrave. Yeah, Story Musgrave, who actually flew on six shuttle missions, believes extraterrestrial life is out there. Despite Edgar Mitchell's assertions that extraterrestrials are, uh, walk among us, Musgrave doesn't share that belief. As he explained to the Huffington Post, quote, some astronauts have been quoted as saying they think that they're here. I have seen their evidence, and for me, it's not evidence. But he continued, I feel that they're everywhere out there, and they're doing interstellar travel. We'll think differently about ourselves once we accept that. It's a kind of interesting position as well, huh? Yeah, for sure. And it was cool that uh, I don't remember. I mean, this was several years ago now, but uh, MUFON even had Story Musgrave speak as the keynote speaker at the, Muf the International Muf MUFON International Symposium. So it was really cool to to hear Story um, in person speak about this stuff. I think it was that in cool. 2011 because we met that him. long ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we met him at the uh, the after party. <laughs> and uh, right. talk to him for a little bit, but <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. he's he's an interesting guy. But again, you know, he's he's. I think it's it's good when you have these astronauts, even if they don't believe UFOs are visiting Earth. You know, he's like the possibility that life is out there is is we got to think almost a hundred percent. You know, it's it's good stance uh, to explore. If you're closed off, I would say you're not the right person to be an astronaut going out to explore other worlds yeah that's a good point yeah if you're if you're not like able and willing to accept that there could be other life out there like why the hell are you exploring space or risking your life to go up <laughs> yeah there? let's be honest so true <laughs> yeah very true and you know i think his position is kind of like i was mentioning before this is <laughs> kind of the what you expect to hear um, because, you know, they, they do have to be careful about it. And, you know, it's, it's the safe thing. And we're even seeing it with TTSA and just the whole state of ufology now. NASA and scientists are saying, oh, yeah, you know, we think life is out there. And believe me, 20 years ago, no one would even say that, right? But then with the discovery of exoplanets and, and then, you know, other things that have progressed, you know, quantum mechanics – they're, they're more accepting of that possibility. And so at first it was baby steps. Hardly anyone would say, oh, yeah, we think there's life out there. But now everybody says that, oh, yeah, there's got to be life out there. But yet no one is still uh, committed to, you know, saying that, yeah, it's been visiting us here. So, you know, it's it's a safe position to take. And actually it's, it's a correct one to take because we don't know yet. We don't have proof. So uh, I think that's a wise thing. Something cool about uh, Story, Mugra Story Musgrave's statements and his stances, though that's slightly different and beyond the, the, the token response there, is that he believes that intelligent life is all over the place out there, but doing interstellar travel. That's, you know, taking it a step further and kind of cool. Yeah. And I wonder why. You know, he does. He looks right? at the evidence of, of Ed Mitchell and others, and it doesn't do it for him. He must have something that makes him feel like they're traveling interstellarly. So I'm really curious about that. It is. Maybe you should uh, follow up with him, Shane. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good little thread to pull. Just to add, Jason, I think you're right. Like the fact that he's bringing up the interstellar thing, that's that's huge. That 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 means that you know he thinks this could be possible. 
maybe within our lifetime, maybe not. But uh, yeah, I think that is a really good line to point out that he said because that 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 opens up a whole new ball game, I would say, in terms of you know them traveling here or us traveling there. So I think that's awesome that he he said that specifically. I do too. No, he's a cool guy. Um, yeah, we should reach out to him. No, he loves talking about this stuff too, and he he speaks about it intelligently. So. Yeah, and who who's yeah, named cool. Story? That's such a cool name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a story in itself. I like it. Well, Scott That's Kelly is an story. astronaut who was in space very recently. And in mid-2018, uh, our former co-worker Alejandro Rojas had the opportunity to ask astronaut Scott Kelly about UFOs. Kelly is someone who has spent a whole lot of time in space, more than 520 days during four different missions, which includes his 340 consecutive days on the International Space Station. That's the longest any U.S. astronaut has spent in space on a single mission. When Rojas asked Kelly about UFOs, he admitted that he's seen lots of strange stuff in space, but the strange things he occasionally saw always turned out to be optical illusions. Kelly says he believes Life is out there, but he holds that stereotypical view that they, whoever they are, are too far away to get here. But he responsibly added that he has no evidence to prove that aliens aren't visiting Earth, but he's 99.9% sure it's not happening. Just a quick interesting side note, Kelly also shared that he saw weird things while he was flying Navy jets over the ocean. Of course, Navy pilots seeing strange aerial objects over the ocean has been a popular topic of conversation in the past couple of years because of the highly publicized Navy UFO encounters from 2004 and 2015 that recently came to light. But again, Kelly says what he saw always turned out to be optical illusions. But it's interesting, too. I mean, when you go back and, and look at you know several of the people we've mentioned, it seems like Navy pilot is a common theme here. You know, I always just thought it was the Air Force that was involved, right? And, um, you know, and of course their position is pretty negative the whole time. But to, you know, to see of late uh, the revelation of all these uh, naval pilots having, having these encounters is, you know, kind of a dimension to it that I wasn't even aware of. So I, I think that's pretty cool. And, it, and, and it's probably likely that other branches of the military and other uh, organizations, other militaries have been having similar experiences, then it's probably much broader in scope than we even were aware of. I think it's also interesting. Um, I, I was looking into a few things that Kelly responded to in terms of the flat earth theory. Um, he, he stated that I flew around the earth, um, but not even like bringing that whole can of worms into this. He said um, there's a lot of dangers in um, disregarding scientific fact, and they use this flat earth theory as, like, you know, proof of that. And um, when you actually, like, believe it, or when you say these things and you don't actually believe them, like, it's just hurting us in terms of moving forward with a topic. So in terms of, like, UFOs, you know, if the science is leading us in a certain direction, trust that. Even if it's not up to your belief standards, like, we got to go where the science leads us. And it's clear that Scott Kelly knows a lot about about that. So I, I think it's pretty cool that he's he's saying, look, put your personal beliefs aside and just go where the facts lead us. And if he's talking about UFOs and still interested in it, like, that's a good sign. It really is. And Scott Kelly and NASA in general, right? I mean, NASA gets a lot of hate from the UFO community because, of course, they get thrown under the bus as the scapegoats with all the con conspiracy stuff that they're hiding <laughs> all of the answers about aliens and UFOs because there are space guys, right? But, I mean, we have mm -hmm. so many astronauts and just people from NASA who talk about this stuff all the time. Yeah, That's NASA amazing. routinely comments about aliens because, as you can imagine, they're asked about it all the time yeah. non-stop mm -hmm. yeah i mean for, there's one example uh that happened in 2014 uh in july scientists discussed extraterrestrial life on a televised event and it took place at nasa headquarters in washington dc and featured leading researchers and engineering experts who all discussed the search for life beyond earth so 
one in particular, Charles Bolden, was the NASA administrator at the time. He even began the event by mentioning how he and fellow former astronaut John Grunsfield are often asked if they've seen, if they believe in, life beyond Earth. And Bolden stated, quote, I can't speak for John, but well, I may not have actually encountered extraterrestrials, and I did not, as a matter of fact, although I looked all the time. I've always been inquisitive, so I was looking really hard. He continued, I would venture to say, however, that most of my colleagues here today, as well as probably most of you in the audience, are probably convinced that it is highly improbable that in the limitless vastness of the universe that we humans stand alone. And again, this is the same thing when we mentioned Story Musgrave, how, uh, you know, all these scientific officials are finally saying there's got to be life out there. We'd be stupid, not stupid, naive <laughs> to think that we are the only intelligent civilization out there. Uh, and so having the NASA administrator and all these people, as you so spoke eloquently before, you know, the UFO, a lot of people in the UFO community have trouble trusting NASA because of uh, believing they're covering up all these things. And yeah. hey, maybe they are covering up some stuff. But don't distrust them because, again, we have to lead, uh, follow where the science is leading us. And our scientists, they're actually actively trying to go find life currently. So the amount of money that's spent into these missions trying to find life on other planets and explore whether there's life under ice crusts and in different atmospheres. I mean, why would we spend so much money and invest so much time if we're not like trying to actively find life, I'm saying keep a little faith in NASA, please, people. Right. And look, I love I love that uh, that press conference and Charles Bolden making those statements. Yeah, of course, we're all pretty accustomed to that safe token response by now. But the way he addressed it, it's a valid response. It's an honest response. And at the very least, it isn't dismissive of the topic, nor does it poke fun at the topic. And I think that's really important. Right. And look at the evolution of that, you know, sort of stock response. It's, it's just gotten more and more positive and expanded and less ridicule involved with it throughout the years. I think that's great, too. Even I would say just in the last 15 years. Absolutely. I mean, I remember when, you know, I first started heavily getting involved in this. It was it was so much more taboo even then compared to the evolution of what's happened and people are feeling safer to speak out about things. And uh, if you're an astronaut, you're going to see something strange for sure, because we don't know what's out there very well, you know? Uh, so it's interesting time to live in. And you mentioned at the beginning, Maureen, I mean, just the, the, Pete, the astronauts we've had the the opportunity to speak with and the uh, the people who work at NASA who we've had the opportunity to speak with, there's just so many people there. I mean, that's – and I think you mentioned it too, Ryan. That's why a lot of people at NASA get into the field they're in, right? They are believers themselves. They actively want to find – civilizations out there you know they grew up on star wars and star trek and that's their inspiration to try to get out into space and find the life that they truly believe is out there and the people we've spoken with over the years who work at nasa and are actively working on these missions that are going to other worlds to find life they are you know extremely hopeful and you know passionate about what they're doing they want to find alien life that's why they do what they do Right. And the fact that just the handful we mentioned today, there's probably many more. And the fact that just that many astronauts are interested in the UFO topic, have seen something or know more than uh, the public knows. That's exciting. The fact that just that amount of people we've spent, we've sent into space or other countries have, and they're coming back saying these sort of profound things. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, and I like to listen to you. Like I said, I like to listen to what people who have been in space have to say because I don't know about you guys. I haven't been in space. So they've seen things that I haven't. And I <laughs> feel they can talk about it better than I can. Absolutely. Well, citizens, that's going to do it for this episode. I'm Jason McClellan. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. I'm Ryan Sprague. I'm Shane Hurd. Do us a favor, <laughs> friends. Always treat the UFO subject with the cautious and responsible skepticism it deserves. Question everything. Have the courage to form your own opinions. 
Keep truth as the focus of your quest, even if the truth conflicts with your opinions. And, of course, stay strange. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network. To learn more, visit entertainmentonepodcast.com.